speaking of choices, uh, the landscape of a lot has changed uh, in our country just as far as advocacy access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are things going on with shortages, insurance coverage, and things like that. Um, what's been going on in, in your in your slice of the world, and, and, and how are some of these changes impacting your work? It's been very it's been very challenging. Um, so much of what we do in the clinic, in the exam room with a patient, depends on what's happening out in the world. And what is happening in D.C. affects what we do quite a bit. Um, some of the areas where, you know, I've been personally invested have been with prior authorizations, um, also Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, this concern of decreased funding for NIH and NCI. And so, you know, I'm. I maintain I maintain a positive attitude where I can, and I think it's important to be an advocate. Um, I think it's important to do simple things such as writing your congressional leaders and writing policymakers. Um, it's important to engage at the state level because more decisions are being made at the state level as well. Um, so state and federal involvement on the personal level, involvement with professional organizations such as ASCO, um, and then being willing to continue to give input and give advice. What I don't want to see is that we become disappointed or that we back away from that mission. Um, ultimately, so much of what we offer our patients comes from NCI-funded research. Um, and we have to stand up and demand that we continue to be a leader in that area. Yeah. Um I'm hearing that conversation a lot, um, and I hope that we continue to be able to continue that work over time because these trials need to happen over years. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you just a, some follow-up questions just about um, classification. So how do you foresee classification evolving as we gain more insights from molecular and immune profiling? Do you mm -hmm. think that, they're gonna, that that's going to be heavily impacted or... What gaps might you do you see maybe um, in current classifications, if any? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it also ties into advocacy. So we are at a crossroads right now in oncology where we have to have the ability to test tumor tissue um, for biomarkers. And that tumor tissue, um, you know, it costs money to do that. We also do liquid biopsies that may be blood or plasma based or CSF based. And quite a few insurance companies do not cover this. So a big barrier to care right now is not everyone has equal access to have biomarker profiling. And if you don't have that biomarker profiling, then we don't truly know what your cancer is. And so every year we gain insight. And just like some of the presentations here, one of the plenary presentations um, with the ESR1 breast cancer, for example, if your doctor hasn't been able to test your tumor for that biomarker, then you don't even know if you're eligible for some of these treatments. And so the testing can be thousands of dollars. So one piece of advocacy is pushing to have biomarker coverage by major insurers. And as we do that, we're going to learn more and more. And then we will take that information and modify our clinical trials. You know, there are some tumor types, biomarker subtypes that we may think are rare that may be common. I mean, we've learned quite a bit. Uh, over the last few years. So I'm hopeful in that regard that tumor profiling will become mainstream and become standard of care. And I'll also add that it's not just looking at the initial diagnosis, but every time a patient has a recurrence or change in their disease, there's an opportunity to analyze again. And so ensuring that we have access to that and that we're not placing undue financial burdens on patients uh, will be really helpful there.